Welcome to the Animal Bites webinar, Animal Bites, What DVMs and Clinics Need to Know. It's presented by the Indiana State Board of Animal Health in cooperation with the Indiana State Department of Health. Welcome. This one hour presentation will allow for one hour of continuing education credit. There is a link on the screen that shows where you can access the quiz. Every individual who takes this webinar must complete the quiz and submit it in order to receive confirmation for eligibility for continuing education credits. Today's presenters will be Dr. Jennifer Brown, State Public Health Veterinarian with the Indiana State Department of Health, Dr. Sandra Norman, Rabies Director for the Board of Animal Health, and Dr. Melissa Justice, Companion Animal Director for the Board of Animal Health. Topics to be covered today include handling human exposures, Indiana rabies laws, handling animal exposures, and a review of scenarios and situations that clinics may encounter. Our first speaker today is going to be Dr. Jennifer Brown from the Indiana State Department of Health. Thank you so much for tuning in to this webinar, and thank you for the essential role that you play in human rabies prevention as veterinary care providers. Rabies in people used to be much more common in the United States. Um, as, mo as recently as the 1950s, we would see uh, about 10 or more cases of human rabies occurring in the United States every year. Um, but in recent years, it's become extremely rare. And this is due to the widespread availability of rabies exposure prophylaxis for people who have been exposed to rabies, as well as to the, to the coordinated efforts of animal control agencies and veterinarians um, who play an essential role in um, reducing the um, uh, roaming of stray animals in communities and making sure that uh, pet dogs and cats and other animals are vaccinated and protected against rabies. So by vaccinating dogs and cats and other patients for rabies, you're playing an essential role in um, a major public health effort to prevent human rabies, which is um, a devastating disease and an important public health problem. Rabies is transmitted in saliva through the bite of an infected animal. And a bite, for public health purposes, is any penetration of the skin by an animal's teeth. So when an animal um, that's rabid bites a person, uh, the virus that's present in the saliva is inoculated under the surface of the skin where it replicates um, and then enters the peripheral nervous system. The virus then ascends, traveling through the peripheral nerves up to the spinal cord, the central nervous system, and then it sends up the spinal cord until it gets to the brain. And when the virus gets to the brain, it causes um, the onset of illness, and that is usually characterized as an acute, um, very severe and rapidly progressive encephalitis, it's almost invariably fatal. Once the virus reaches the brain, it passes to the salivary glands, and this is where um, the person, or uh, if another animal has been bitten, um, the animal would serve as a source of infection to, um, to other people or other animals. Rabies is maintained in nature in the United States in wild animal reservoirs, and the four species that are of greatest importance in the United States are bats, skunks, raccoons, and foxes. Bat rabies is found throughout the United States, except for Hawaii. So on um, the map at the right-hand side of this slide, bat rabies is actually not shown, because if bat rabies were to be presented on this map, the entire um, continental United States would be colored in, as well as Canada and Mexico. Bat rabies is, is present throughout North America. In land animals, like skunks and foxes, there's uh, different geographic foci uh, where these variants are circulating. So on the East Coast, we are um, on the tail end of an epizootic or an animal epidemic of rabies among raccoons. And then I also want to draw your attention to the, um, the North Central Skunk variant, which is shown here in blue, present in the upper Midwest and northern Great Plains states, as well as Kentucky, Tennessee, and Michigan. This variant has been present in South Central Indiana as recently as 2004, but has not been detected since then. So we're pretty confident that we don't currently have rabies circulating among skunks in Indiana, although we need to remain vigilant because um, it could return. Uh, you know, these uh, geographic boundaries expand and contract depending on the population dynamics of these species. 
where the virus is present in land animals is important because um, when the virus is present in land animals, the risk that a domestic animal like a dog or cat would become infected is much higher. So um, the number one domestic animal to be detected with rabies in the United States every year are cats. And uh, where we see a, a lot of those cases occurring are on the East Coast um, where raccoon variant is circulating or in the central United States where skunk variants are circulating. All mammals are physiologically susceptible to rabies, but small prey animals like lagomorphs, rodents, or other pocket pets um, are, don't typically carry rabies in the wild. And that's because a small prey animal um, wouldn't really, um, if it were attacked by a, a, another animal that was rabid, um, probably would not survive long enough to then um, go on and develop symptoms and be capable of transmitting the infection to other animals. So these species we consider to be so low risk that we usually don't recommend rabies testing, and we usually don't recommend rabies trophy for people bitten by these species. But if you have an unusual situation, please contact us and we can talk that over. This chart is showing you the, the last year that we saw each of these species um, detected with rabies in the state of Indiana. So all the way to the right, the red line is showing you 2019, where we are now. The last rabid bat that we detected in Indiana was last year in 2018, although as we move forward this year, I would expect that we will start seeing rabid bats being detected in our state. That happens every year. Um, you can see going back a little bit that the last rabid skunk we had was in 2004. Um, we did have a rabid horse a few years prior, although I believe um, that horse had a bat variant of the virus and not the skunk variant. And then I want to call your attention to um, the fact that the last dog or cat that we had that was positive for rabies in the state of Indiana was back in the 1980s. So um, it's, you know, it's always possible that we could see that happening um, at any time because we have the virus present in bats. And it's always possible that a dog or cat could acquire the infection from a bat and then develop rabies. But we haven't seen that happen since the 1980s. So we're beginning um, our risk assessments of human bites with a low prior probability that any given dog or cat um, is carrying rabies, even strays. This chart is showing you the number of bat rabies cases we've had every year for the last 10, 15 years or so. Our baseline would be about 10 to 20 rabid bats in a given year. Um, we did see uh, a bit of an increase in rabid bat activity from 2009 to 2012. Um, but we have since returned to a, what I would consider to be our baseline of about 10 to 20 rabid bats per year. And these bats are coming from all different parts of the state, north to south, east to west. Bat rabies is found throughout the state of Indiana, and a bat collected from any part of the state should be considered as um, being potentially rabid. One important thing to remember about bat bites is that they can inflict very limited injury. So the most commonly identified uh, rabies positive bat in Indiana is this species here, the big brown bat. This is an insectivorous bat with very tiny needle sharp teeth. So tiny, in fact, that if one of these guys bites you, um, you almost might not be able to see the bite wound with the naked eye. So on the left hand side, we have a picture here of a person whose finger was bitten by a big brown bat earlier on the same day that the photo was taken. And if you didn't know there was something there, you would hardly be able to see it. So I don't usually recommend using a physical exam uh, to rule out the possibility of a bat bite. Um, certainly not in a person, and um, especially um, not in a veterinary patient, because if it's this hard to see on a person's finger, then it would be virtually impossible to see a bat bite on hairy skin. So we'll talk a little bit about handling human exposures. I work at the Indiana State Department of Health, so I'm responsible for uh, protecting human populations against rabies. If you ever have any questions about situations where a person has been bitten or how a person should be managed after a bite, um, then you are welcome to call me. And those are the situations we'll be talking about right now. So um, our state health department has regulations um, about reporting of animal bites. Uh, uh, every case of a person bitten by a domestic or wild mammal must be reported within 24 hours um, to the local health officer having jurisdiction over the county where that the bite victim lives. And um, 
the if a physician is in attendance, if a physician sees the bite victim for their wound, then it um, is actually encoded in state law that it's the physician's responsibility to report the bite. Um, but there may be some situations where um, you might, as a veterinarian, might be aware that a bite has occurred um, and that, that a physician has not been involved. And in that case, this reporting obligation uh, would fall to you as a, um, as a health professional with knowledge of a bite having occurred. And, um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Um, these bites are reported to the local health officer, although some local health officers have delegated animal bite investigation responsibilities to other local agencies like animal control or law enforcement. And the reason why we do these investigations is to decide if a person who's been bitten by a mammal needs to get rabies post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent them from developing clinical rabies. Your obligations in this situation um, First would be to refer the, the bite victim to a healthcare provider. So for example, if you have um, a, an employee at your clinic who's bitten by an animal and you send them off to an occupational health clinic for workman's comp coverage, or if you send them to their primary care provider, then you can be assured that um, the, the reporting obligation would pass to the healthcare provider. You would be relieved of your reporting obligation at that point. Um, because they are required by law to do that reporting. Um, but again, in those situations where you learn of a bite and um, it's not clear that a healthcare provider has been involved, so for example, if one of your clients says that um, that your patient um, bit bit her grandson last week, um, or or if you have other um, other information about a bite, then it does become your obligation to report. And this is important because um, you might be the only person who knows about a, a situation um, where an intervention would make it possible to prevent further human injury. So maybe um, you're the only one um, in a position of authority who knows that a child is in, in an unsafe situation at home. Or maybe you're the first one to learn that a dog's aggression is becoming a larger threat to the community where the dog lives. Um, so it's a potential liability um, to be aware of the information and not, not pass it on to the appropriate authorities. In addition to reporting, we would also ask that you um, maintain accurate information about a biting animal and then um, provide that information when requested to public health authorities or animal control agencies who, um, who need it to complete their investigations. And then finally, um, we would always recommend um, if a person's been bitten by an animal that the rabies status of that animal be verified, um, whether that be through a post-bite 10-day um, quarantine or by um, euthanasia and rabies testing of the animal. And so we would ask that um, you be uh, aware of the need to verify the rabies status of a biting animal and also be aware of of options in your community uh, for assisting um, clients who are in, in this situation. So um, if, a, if a client um, a, has a pet that's bitten a person and a post-bite quarantine is required, um, maybe they're not able to do it at home, um, it would be helpful if, if you would be aware of options uh, where you could refer them for help, like maybe the local animal shelter, or you may even wish to consider um, offering quarantine services to your clients on a fee-for-service basis um, as, as a service to your clients. Um, likewise, if a, a patient um, has bitten someone and the best choice is rabies testing, um, there may be local agencies that perform those services like local animal control, but there may also be situations where um, local animal control doesn't have the capacity to, to perform rabies testing. And in those cases, um, it would be great for you all to consider offering um, decapitation, euthanasia, shipping services um, to your clients on a fee-for-service basis to help them accomplish um, and meet their obligations um, for rabies testing. This is our Indiana Animal Bite Report Form. You can find this online at the Indiana State Department of Health website. There's a link down there at the bottom of the page. Um, these are probably the most direct route to report would be to send these to the local health department um, the, uh, that serves the county where the bite victim lives. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some local health departments might um, delegate these responsibilities for investigation to local animal control or local law enforcement, and so they might prefer that you send these reports um, to one of those entities. 
If you're not sure, you can always send us the bite report form at the state health department and we can make sure it gets where it needs to go. Um, but even better would be for you to reach out to your local health department and say, um, hey, when I get, when I get an animal bite um, report uh, or if I learn of an animal bite, how would you like for me to report that to you? you know, what actions would you like for me to take? And they can tell you um, what the best thing to do is in your own jurisdiction. So when these sites are reported, we do our public health investigation to decide if the victim needs post-exposure prophylaxis. And the way that we do this investigation is to ask two questions in this order. First question is, did sufficient contact occur to allow rabies virus to be transmitted? And if so, the second question would be, was the, uh, was the biting animal rabid or should we suspect that the biting animal could have been rabid? So sufficient contact would include, of course, um, any penetration of skin by an animal's tooth or a bite exposure. There's also a couple of ways, uh, theoretical ways, that you could be exposed to rabies um, without a bite occurring. For example, if saliva or CSF were introduced into mucous membranes or into an open wound. And then there's um, some special scenarios involving bats because of, of the, um, the, the limited injury inflicted by bat bites. Um, and we also have some concern that that might not always be recognized um, or detected by an exposed person. So if a bat is found in the same room with a deeply sleeping person, an unattended child, or a person who's impaired by drugs or alcohol, or a person who has a cognitive dysfunction or disability, we would consider that person to potentially be exposed. And in fact, uh, my recommendation would be that any time a bat is found in the living area um, of a, a, a person's residence, that that bat should probably just go ahead and be tested for rabies um, because you'll be surprised sometimes when these bats are tested um, and they come up positive. Sometimes we learn about exposures that weren't disclosed to us at the time that the bat was submitted. So I would always recommend um, that a bat found in a residence um, in the living area be tested. If we determine that sufficient contact occurred, the next question becomes, well, was the animal rabid? And um, if the biting animal is a rabies vector species um, and the animal is available, we always want to, um, to gather evidence to determine if the animal was rabid. And the two ways we can do that are through the 10-day quarantine or, or rabies testing. Uh, we always want to gather this evidence about the animal's rabies status. Even if the animal's current on rabies vaccination, we still do this. And even if um, the circumstances suggest that there was a low probability that the animal had clinical rabies at the time of the bite, we still do this. So we always um, gather evidence if it's possible to, to collect evidence because the animal is available. So the two options that we have are the 10-day quarantine um, and rabies testing. The 10-day quarantine has only been validated for dogs, cats, and ferrets. Um, these are the only species for which this quarantine period has been scientifically validated. In other words, um, they're the only species um, where if an animal completes a 10-day quarantine, then we can be confident that they were not capable of transmitting rabies at the time that the bite occurred at the beginning of the quarantine. Um, the 10-day quarantine um, is, is our preferred way of assessing an animal's rabies status, uh, but there may be some situations where um, it would not be humane to complete a 10-day quarantine or it might not be possible to complete a 10-day quarantine. And in those situations where a 10-day quarantine cannot be completed, then um, we would want rabies testing to be done on dogs, cats, and spirits. For wild animals, such as uh, bats, skunks, raccoons, or foxes, um, the 10-day quarantine is not, has not been validated and is not acceptable. So wild animals that are involved in human bites must be tested for rabies if they are rabies vector species. So again, just to review, um, indications for rabies testing, um, dogs, cats, and ferrets for which a 10-day quarantine cannot be completed. Any animal exhibiting neurologic symptoms, um, if an animal is neurologic, I would consider that to elevate the risk that rabies was transmitted at the time of the bite, so that animal should be tested. Um, if it's a rabies reservoir species, like a bat, skunk, fox, or raccoon, that elevates the risk that rabies was transmitted, so that animal should be tested. And then if it's another carnivore or possible vector species, like a coyote or a possum, we would want those animals to be tested as well. 
All laboratory testing for rabies is done at the Indiana State Department of Health Laboratory here in Indianapolis. And we have some information um, on our website about um, specimen submission for rabies testing. Here's some of the highlights there. So we would like to ask that you not submit live animals to the Indiana State Department of Health Laboratory for rabies testing. Um, this is, it's not safe to transport live animals to the lab um, for testing, and it's not safe for our microbiologists to accept live animals at the lab. So um, we would ask that, um, that you euthanize animals prior to submission. Bats may be submitted whole or intact, but all other species may not. So um, anything that is not a bat must be decapitated and the head submitted, um, or if you, um, if you choose, um, the brain tissue could be collected and submitted, although um, I would recommend that you simply do the decapitation and not attempt to collect brain tissue um, because that's just exposing yourself unnecessarily um, to a potentially um, infectious tissue. Um, the specimens can be refrigerated for up to 72 hours. Uh, we do usually recommend not to freeze specimens. Um, however, there's no reason to be worried if a specimen is accidentally frozen. This won't impact the test results uh, in terms of their accuracy. Um, it will just delay the results because the specimen needs to be dissected to be tested, and that can't happen until the cadaver or the head thaws out. These specimens should be shipped on cold packs and um, should be shipped for delivery during normal business hours. So we can't accept these specimens on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, please, it, they must only be um, arrive at our lab Monday through Friday during normal business hours. So if it's a Friday afternoon, I would just pop that, um, that specimen in the fridge over the weekend and then wait to ship it to us until Monday. Please do select an overnight delivery service, even if you think it's very likely that a cheaper service will still get there overnight. Um, we would ask that you um, select a guaranteed overnight delivery service. Um, if you don't do this then, and there's a delay in shipping, then um, that it could render that specimen unsatisfactory for testing, um, especially in, um, in warmer weather. There's two different ways you can request testing from the State Health Department Laboratory. On our left, we have the rabies specimen request form, which you can download off um, the laboratory website and, and fill out and enclose along with the specimen upon shipping. And then on the right-hand side is a picture of our LIMSNET portal, our laboratory information management system. Um, you do have to create an account and uh, maintain a current password to have access to this system. Um, but if it's important to you to have copies of, uh, of the test results, then I would encourage you to use LIMSNET uh, because if you, um, if you submit using only the paper requisition form, then we do not routinely provide hard copies um, or PDFs of the negative lab results um, for anyone who's not a LIMSNET user. So if you want those test results for your patient files, then you do have to be a LIMSNET user to get those negative results. Positive results will always notify um, by phone immediately um, upon completion of the laboratory testing. I want to just mention, um, in case you don't know, that there is a, a way that bats can be euthanized with minimal handling. Um, intraperitoneal injection is fine, but it's not ideal for a rabies suspect because um, we obviously want to minimize handling of a potentially rabid animal. So one thing you can do is use a euthanasia chamber. It doesn't have to be as nice as the one in this picture on the right, which was prepared by a bat sanctuary. Um, you could just use your, um, your chamber that you used to um, to lock down cats, or you could even use the container that the bat um, arrives at the hospital in if it's, uh, if it's in an airtight container, like a coffee can with a lid or a, a disposable Tupperware. You see in the lower right-hand corner of that euthanasia chamber on the right, there's a syringe casing with some cotton balls. What you're going to do is take some liquid isoflurane and just saturate um, that cotton ball and, um, and just put that in the euthanasia chamber with the bat and seal it up. And then the off-gassing of the isoflurane will quickly euthanize the bat and very little handling will be required. So to sum up, um, in situations where a person is bitten by a dog, cat, or ferret and the animal is alive and healthy, 
we would want that animal to complete a 10-day quarantine, and this is the requirement regardless of the animal's vaccination status. So even currently vaccinated animals have to have their, um, their infectious status verified um, if they bite a person. If the animal survives the quarantine, um, we, that is evidence that they were not capable of transmitting rabies at the time that the bite occurred and the bite victim doesn't need prophy. If the animal dies during the quarantine or if the animal can't be quarantined for whatever reason, we would want it to be um, uh, decapitated and submitted for rabies testing. And then the person who was bitten will get a recommendation for rabies prophy depending on those test results. I want to remind you, um, those of you watching this who have been previously vaccinated against rabies, that if you are exposed to rabies, you still will need post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, just because you're previously vaccinated doesn't mean that you don't need rabies shots if you have an exposure. You do need um, a lot fewer shots and you don't need immune globulin. Um, it's much less invasive and less expensive um, to get prophy if you've been previously vaccinated than if you've never been vaccinated. So there are some definite advantages there. Um, you do want to check your titers every couple years using the RIFIT test, which is done at Kansas State University. And if your titers drop, then you would just get a single rabies booster to bring them back up. And you can talk to your doctor or an occupational health clinic, or if you have questions, you can also call me at the State Health Department. Uh, I'll close my section by saying that um, we are available um, for consultation 24-7 uh, at the Indiana State Department of Health. You can call this number, which is our main number. Um, after hours, you'll get an automated menu. If you press 1, you will um, be connected with the epidemiologist on call. And um, they've all been trained on um, basic rabies risk assessment. And if it's a, an unusual situation or a complex one, um, all of the epidemiologists on call also have the ability to reach me or someone who's covering for me after hours. So um, we are at your service if you need our assistance. With that, I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Sandy Norman, Director of the Rabies Program at the Indiana State Board of Animal Health. Thank you for everybody attending. This is Dr. Sandy Norman with the Board of Animal Health, and we're gonna go over just really briefly what she covered because we're going to talk about vaccination and quarantine laws. Just remember that if an animal bites a person and it's a high-risk species, there is no quarantine period and there is no vaccination recognized for these high-risk species. You need to euthanize the animal and submit the tissue or the head for testing or in the case of a bat, the entire bat. And there is no approved quarantine period for these species. And for people bitten by a dog, cat, and ferret, this does mean that they are quarantinable and we would prefer that you quarantine them. If they're vaccinated, you observe them for 10 days. It's always 10 days. If they're not vaccinated or there is no proof, you quarantine them for 10 days and then you vaccinate them at the end of the 10 days. They may be euthanized without testing at the end of the 10 days. In other words, as long as they've completed the 10 day quarantine period, they're not transmitting rabies and then they can be euthanized at that point. All other species, you can contact the State Department of Health or uh, the Board of Animal Health and we'll help you work through those situations. Now we're going to go on to Indiana rabies vaccination and quarantine laws. Um, just so you know that vaccination of all dogs, cats, and ferrets three months of age and older are directed by the Board of Animal Health Administrative Code, and we've cited the, the place in the law where that is, is identified. There are one- and three-year products available and approved for use in dogs and cats. The ferret only has a one-year product approved, and livestock also have certain products approved. Just remember that the one-year product has to be given annually because it is only good for one year. If you're going to give the three-year product, we want to remind you that the three-year product is always a booster. The first time that you give the product, either to a three-month-old animal, three months of eight, three months of age older animal, or an animal who has never received a rabies vaccine, the initial rabies vaccination of a three-year product is the only last one year. The three a year later, you can give a booster vaccination. Remember, the three-year vaccination is always a booster vaccination, and then it is good for three years. Remember that local ordinances um, may direct um, how, how these products are used and what is involved. And then also remember that, um, that if the animal is overdue for the vaccination, you can give a vaccination at the time the animal is presented, and it is good for the duration of the vaccine that you give. So in the case of vaccination, the Indiana law does not require, does not allow 
waivers are exempt and requires the vaccine to be given. So these are not permitted, and neither do titer tests replace a current rabies vaccine. So current rabies vaccine is only achieved by giving the rabies vaccination is at a one or three year period. Now we do understand that people do want to do titers. Titers do not show um, the ability to fight the disease. So titers are not acceptable. Now owners may refuse vaccination. We understand that. Just make them understand that their pets will be considered unvaccinated and handled appropriately in exposure and bite situations. And in that case, it's a longer quarantine period or maybe a quarantine period away from the home. They will be required if they bite a person to be vaccinated at the end of that 10 day period or if they have an extended quarantine period, they will have to be vaccinated at the beginning. So just remind them that if they choose not to vaccinate their animals, there are, are consequences. Um, vaccinate, excuse me. Uh, vaccination of off-label or other species other than dog, cats, and ferrets and approved livestock species may be done by the veterinarian at his discretion. I want you to understand that Indiana law, both the Board of Animal Health and the State Department of Health do not recognize this vaccination status in the case of a bite situation. So if it is a wild animal or off-label species, and that includes wolf and wolf hybrids, the animal must be sacrificed and tested for rabies. And so they, since there is no live animal testing, they have to, the head has to be submitted or the brain tissue. In the case of equine and livestock species, there are approved vaccines for horses, cattle, and sheep. They are not required by BOA, but we want a reminder to tell you that 4-H does require rabies vaccination for horses that are being exhibited in 4-H events. This is done per the product label. There is either an annual, and in the case of sheep, a three-year vaccine available for these livestock species. The veterinary obligations in the case of rabies vaccination, you are required to provide written proof of vaccination to the owner. You as a veterinarian must retain a copy of that vaccination certificate and according to the Practice Act, you're required to retain that for three years. That's part of the records requirement. And in the case, there may be a third copy that local officials, if you have a local licensing or registration requirement, they also may require you to submit a copy of the rabies vaccination certificate to them. You need to check your local ordinances to see if that is required. The other obligation you have is, is that in the case of an investigation such as Dr. Brown identified in a bite situation to determine the rabies status, you have to provide the records to authorities who are doing the investigation. And that usually involves providing the, the rabies vaccination certificate or any records or any notes that you have made in regards to the animal. You also have to provide a rabies vaccination tag to the owner for dogs, cats, and ferrets. They're not required to wear it. We suggest that the dog wear it. On the tag, you, you need to have the name of your clinic or the name of the place where the vaccination occurred and a phone number to which you can be identified. Sometimes this is the only identification on the animal and animal control officials can use it to identify who the animal belongs to. The 10-day quarantine must follow this time protocol. And the only time you do not do a 10-day quarantine is euthanasia is need for humane reasons, i.e. the animal is dying and it has been somebody in the process or the animal is being brought in for euthanasia and a human bite has occurred in less than 10 days or it cannot be safely quarantined due to aggression. And we'd like you to call us and talk about this. But we would really prefer that dog, cats, and ferrets have and complete the 10-day quarantine. The location is determined by local animal control public health officials. Um, many of these quarantines are done at home. And so the state does not specify where the quarantine is done. Local ordinances or rules or animal controls or health departments may specify where the quarantine is done, i.e. if the animal cannot be retained at home or if the animal's vaccination status is unknown and it, or you at the veterinary office have the better ability to keep the animal for 10 days. Just remember that all quarantine procedures, the cost is the responsibility of the animal owner and that's identified in our code and our administrative code. So remember that any quarantine that is done, that should be paid for by the animal owner. 10 day quarantine requirements. Well, we would like the animal to be securely confined and even if that's at home, we would like you to prevent from elective contact with people and that generally means the general public. We understand that this animal will have contact with the family, but we would like to keep them from having contact with the outside general public and also other animals outside the home. The rabies vaccination is given after the 10-day quarantine when a human bite is involved. 
you want to report any illnesses promptly to the local health department because that may necessitate euthanizing animals. Animals that die or euthanized during that 10-day quarantine period should have the head removed and the tissue submitted for rabies testing. So this is the 10-day quarantine period that is associated with animal bites to people. Okay, for animal bites or exposures between animals, which is something that you or the clinic may be dealing with, if you're handling the biter and it's a high-risk species, and this includes wolves and wolf hybrids, there is no quarantine period and there is no vaccination recognized, even though one may have been given. So since both of those qualifications have been met, you need to euthanize and submit the head for testing. Not a recognized vaccine, no approved quarantine period. If you're handling a dog, cat, or ferret, we also observe the 10-day quarantine period as a member of policy. So if the vaccination is current, we don't need a booster vaccine, we just need to observe them for 10 days. If they're unvaccinated and there's no proof, we quarantine and observe for 10 days and we vaccinate after the 10-day strict quarantine. If you're handling a pet that's bitten by an unknown or rabies-positive animal, this is an animal that's tested positive for rabies or they've had contact with the animal and we don't have the animal available. If the, if the dog, cat, if dog, cat, or ferret, the animal is current on vaccinations, and the only ones that can be current are dog, cats, and ferrets, or it's overdue and it has had a previous rabies vaccination, you need to vaccinate or booster the animal within 96 hours of exposure. So if they arrive at your clinic and they were bitten the night before, you need to give a rabies vaccine. And in the case of the animals that are current or overdue, you observe them for 45 days. If the animal is totally unvaccinated, there's no record of a rabies vaccine, there's no proof of a rabies vaccine, we still administer the killed rabies virus vaccine within 96 hours of exposure. But because it is totally unvaccinated and protected, it should be quarantined and observed for four months. And in this case, the Board of Animal Health frequently helps local health departments, and animal control or law enforcement with issuing a quarantine for four months, especially if the animal is exposed to a confirmed positive rabies animal. When you're handling a pet that's bitten by a dog, cat, or ferret, or livestock, and these are quarantinable species, if the vaccination is current, we, we simply treat the wounds, and there's really no observation period involved. If it's unvaccinated or overdue, we vaccinate at the time of the bite, and we treat the wounds. For animals and animal exposures, remember, there's high risk or unknown animals, and these are very common scenarios that we get calls about at the Board of Animal Health. A cat carrying or playing with a bat, and that's probably our most common one. A dog that gets into a fight with a raccoon or a skunk. Or commonly, we get a pet that comes home with bite wounds and we do not know, and the animal is unknown. We don't know if it was another cat or dog or if it was a wild animal. So if it's available, if it's available, if that animal they get into fight with, i.e. the animal kills the animal and you're able to find it, you can submit that head or wild animal for testing. And that way we'll know what the status is. And if it's unavailable, then we treat it just like the previous slides as a potentially rabid animal because we just don't know and it could be a high risk animal. So again, we treat the vaccinated and unvaccinated animal just as we would as if it was a rabid animal. Now that completes our section on vaccination and, uh, and animal to animal exposures and quarantines. Dr. Melissa Justice now is going to deal with some common scenarios and situations that may occur in your practice. I want to wrap things up today by talking about some of the frequently asked questions that we get here at the Board of Animal Health. Hopefully, by going over some of these scenarios and situations, we can um, touch on something that you may experience in your practice um, and help you know better how to handle with them. One of the questions that we get is, when is the situation an emergency? And we certainly understand that when someone is bitten, they um, often feel a high sense of urgency. A lot of times a person who's bitten wants to run right to their medical provider um, and start getting post-exposure prophylaxis so that they don't die of rabies. Um, and so we've characterized some situation or classified some situations into high priority or non-emergency. High priorities are situations where a decision needs to be made quickly um, and we need to get the animal to, you know, get the, the animal in quarantine or we need to get the, uh, samples submitted to the laboratory for testing um, so that we can make decisions about how the humans involved need to be taken care of. Some of those high priority situations might be um, when a human is bitten on or close to the head. As Dr. Brown mentioned earlier, the virus has to um, 
replicate in the tissues, travel up the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system, and then finally settle into the brain and salivary glands. So obviously a, a situation where a bite occurs on or close to the head is going to have less travel time to get up to the brain and the salivary glands. Um, when a human is bitten by a high-risk species, such as a bat, a fox, a raccoon, or a skunk, we would consider those to be a high priority. Or when a human is bitten by an animal that's exhibiting signs consistent with rabies virus or neurologic signs, those would all be situations where, you know, we would encourage you to contact us after hours to get questions answered or go ahead and get those samples submitted to the laboratory pretty quickly. Um, in non-emergency situations, these are things that you can, you know, you can handle the next business day, you can get in contact with us the next business day if you have questions. And these would be animal to animal bites or exposures or human bites when all of the parties are known and the animal is retained at the clinic and is available for observation or testing. Another situation that we get a lot is, um, how do I break it to the owner that we need to do rabies testing? And we understand that, that these can be very, very difficult conversations to have with owners. Um, obviously, usually when someone presents to you, the animals either had a traumatic experience or the owners have had a traumatic experience where the owner or where the, the, the animal has suddenly become very, very aggressive. And it can be a very emotional time to have these types of conversations. We want to remind you that there's no live animal testing for rabies. Um, there's no tissue that can be submitted from a live animal that can tell you the rabies status of that animal. Um, so when you're, when you're faced with the conversation and, and you need to explain to someone that you need to test their animal, just remember that sometimes less is more. You don't have to explain the full details of the sample submission to the owner. As veterinary professionals, sometimes I think we become um, complacent and we become kind of immune to the gory details of our job. Um, and we have a tendency to overshare with anyone and everyone around us. So just remember when you're, you know, when you're broaching the subject with a client, you don't necessarily have to use terminology like decapitate or removing the head. Um, and practice a lot of times if I'm faced with this situation, I'll just explain to the owner that we, you know, unfortunately because the animal has bitten someone and can't observe the 10 day quarantine for whatever reason, we need to sub submit some samples to the laboratory to make sure that the um, animal doesn't have the capability of transmitting rabies. Um, and in that situation, I, I, we would never um, recommend that you lie to an owner or not tell them the full details if they're asked, but just remember, you don't have to tell them everything right off the bat. You can be a little bit delicate about that. Another situation is um, that some clinics will offer complimentary group cremation to owners so that you can avoid sending a sampled animal home for burial. And I found that in some situations, owners will elect to take the home, the animal home for burial for monetary reasons or financial reasons. And sometimes just by offering up complimentary cremation, um, you won't necessarily have to send home a sampled animal with them. We get a lot of questions about where are my test results. Um, and as Dr. Brown said, all results are immediately available to LIMSNET users. Um, and the negative results will always be posted there. You may not or you will not be notified of negative test results um, to your clinic if you don't have access to LIMSNET. Specimens that are received at the laboratory by 11 a.m. will get tested on that same business day. If they're received after 11 a.m., they'll be tested the following business day. Rest assured, though, that if the animal's test result is positive, someone will contact you, the submitter, and the exposed person, as well as the local health department immediately to discuss what actions need to be taken um, to uh, the animal or to the human that's been exposed. There are going to be certain situations when the results are ur urgently needed um, to make decisions about human prophylactic care. And in those situations, you can contact the Rabies Epidemiology Division at 317-233-7125. We'd encourage you not to contact that number, though, just to get routine test results. Um, otherwise, you might tie up a line that could be used to help other people answer questions and, and work through delicate situations that they're facing. Another situation that we get, or another question that we get, is when the animal dies and the owner wants to know the cause of death, that the animal bit someone. And in that situation, we would recommend that you go ahead and submit the entire animal to the laboratory for necropsy, but make it very, very clear on the accession form or the submission form that the animal is a rabies suspect, that it bit someone, 
and the rabies sample must be submitted to ISDH. Those laboratories are happy to collect that sample on your behalf and submit them to the laboratory. You just need to make sure that it's very, very clear on the submission form that that's something that needs to be done because this isn't something that they routinely do on all animals. Another question that we get is, um, how do, I, how do I make a decision about whether or not to test an animal if it's after business hours? Um, so a lot of you may be practicing on nights, holidays, or weekends, or through emergency services, and you may not necessarily feel like you have ready access to us at BOA or at the State Department of Health. If that situation is a non-emergency, you can go ahead and you can refrigerate that animal and then contact BOA or Indiana State Department of Health on the next business day. But remember that we have priority guidance, and if you feel like the situation is a high priority, go ahead and call the after hours business line um, and speak to someone on call to get your questions answered. This, this question comes up a lot. What do you do if the owner refuses to test the animal after a bite? In that situation, you can maintain control of the animal at your facility, keep it and refrigerate it until the next business day, and then you can contact your local health department or the state health department and they can uh, help explain to the owner why the testing is required. Um, it's actually required by Indiana state law, so they can help you to, to help the owner understand why it's important that that animal be tested so that we can make evidence-based decisions on post-exposure care of the humans involved. One thing I will tell you though, in these situations, make sure to, to make detailed notes in your medical record um, that you informed the owner that the animal needed to be tested, that the animal, uh, that the owner refused, um, just to cover yourself so that if it ever comes up that, you know, they say that they weren't informed, you have the, the proof in your medical records that you told them everything they needed to know about that situation. Lastly, I want to cover some resources that are available to you at all times. Our website, www.in.gov slash BOA, um, is available to you all the time, and we have a link on the left-hand side of that web page that's entitled Rabies. If you go to that link, there are several different um, types of information or resources that are available to you. We have a copy of the Indiana's Rabies Rule that you can download and print out. We have information and links that will tell you your local health department phone numbers, the state health department phone number, um, phone number for the Department of Natural Resources as well as BOA. There's also the bite report form that you can download and, and um, print out. There are submission forms for rabies samples to go to the State Health Department Laboratory, both the PDF format and the link to the LIMSNET system. And there are some fact sheets that are available that you can print out and help provide to owners so that they can understand why we vaccinate, why we have these laws, and why we may require a quarantine or testing of an animal. All veterinary clinics in the, in the state should have access to a rabies card, which is um, seen here on the slide on the right, which is the guidelines for post-exposure rabies treatment. And what this is, is a bifold card that essentially is a flow chart or a decision tree that can help you make decisions about what to do in your practice. There's a section for animal to human exposures, and there's a section for animal to animal exposures. And you can go through those flow charts and help determine what needs to be done in your particular situation. Um, we're in the process of updating these cards, um, and I, it should be done at some point in the future with the new information and new quarantine timelines from the new rabies compendium. Um, but uh, you can use these cards that you already have in your possession to determine what you need to do. And if you have questions, feel free to give us a call. Um, if you don't have one of these cards and you'd like one, please feel free to contact the Indiana State Board of Animal Health and we can get one sent to you. Um, for human exposures, remember that you can always contact your local county health department or the Indiana State Health Department. And for animal exposures, you can contact the Indiana State Board of Animal Health and talk to either myself or Dr. Sandy Norman. Here's the link that you need to click on to, in order to be able to take the quiz. Just remember that all participants must submit a quiz, um, a fully completed quiz to the Board of Animal Health in order to receive a certificate that you completed this one hour of CE. Um, so make sure and do that. We wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with us and to learn a little bit more about rabies. If you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. 